afternoon. Hi, everybody. My name's Tara Judah. I'm the cinema producer here at Watershed. I am also for this afternoon, un pomme de terre. Uh, much thanks to the suit making goes to the crew at 20th Century Flicks, Becca Lewis and Daisy Steinhardt, who have put this together. Um, if you don't know why I'm wearing a potato, that's absolutely fine. You will find out in the course of the next hour. Some of you might already know why. Um, we're going to be looking at the films of Agnes Varda today and the concept of her playfully serious or seriously playful work and how she looks at really serious issues through... Um, humor, wit, love and warmth and we'll be taking a little bit of a potted history through some of her films. Uh, I'd like to say that an hour is nowhere near enough time to cover it all so there's going to have to be um, a taster for what you'll have to explore after today. Um, we, this is part of the Gleaning Truth season here at Watershed uh, and also across the UK so you have the opportunity, we've shown some of the films already this month, they're continuing, um, there's still three left so there's The Beaches of Agnes, uh, Jaco Dunant and The Gleaners and I still to catch. Um, this is also a kind of celebration of her at a point in her career where she's been making films for over 60 years. She started at the age of 25, so uh, she has a really long-running career. And the eight films showing are really just a starter of, of a taste of what there is on offer because she made a lot of short films as well and lots of other features. So uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about today... Um, are showing here, some of them are not, but it's just to give a kind of overview to some of her work and to sort of interrogate a few of the themes. Also wanted to let everybody know a couple of housekeeping things. One is that uh, this, this talk is being recorded. Um, if you do want to contribute and talk, you're welcome to pop your hand up. I'll be showing clips and, just, and going through her work, but there'll be time as well at the end if you just want to chat um, more informally or if you want to kind of leave your question to the end if you have one. You also don't have to ask any questions. You can just be entertained by the potato suit for an hour if you like um, and also that there's some feedback forms so if you fancy filling those out uh, they also kind of help to go towards you know do you want more events like this or not <laughs> which is a question I'll let you answer um, so that's the sort of context for the beginning of this event just want to welcome you all and say thank you very much for coming um, I just also love to get a bit of an idea of whether or not there's anyone in the room who is completely new to Agnes Varda who hasn't seen any of her films and and it's kind of a, a first step or you've all seen at least some, yeah okay great um, and, and, and many of you probably have seen some of her work Anyone seen all of her work? No, me either. The greatest joy about that is that it means there's something to look forward to in your future. There's something really warm and beautiful to dive into um, and something yet to discover, which I think is amazing. Uh, for my own part, I haven't seen Jacques Adenon and I'm really excited about being able to see it in the cinema here next week. So what I'll be saying about that film will be brief because I myself have not seen it yet. Um, so let's start by talking a little bit about um, Agnes Varda and, and what she kind of set out to do, who she was, this 25 year old who came to filmmaking. And she said when she started, um, and, and kind of retrospectively, that she wanted to invent cinema. She wanted to invent cinema and be happy to be a woman. I wanted to be radical. I wanted to find shapes. So the idea of inventing cinema is quite bold, <laughs> especially coming in at the kind of 1950s. <laughs> There's been cinema since the 1890s. We've had you know, pre-cinema since before that. But she really did think that she was such a radical filmmaker uh, when she came to this, that she was going to be the person to make cinema. Um, and she wanted to invent its language. And in a way, she did. Uh, she hadn't really seen very many films before she embarked upon her filmmaking career. Uh, she says in different interviews, somewhere around 10 or 20 films was as much as she'd seen. Um, but she did have a photographic and fine art background. So she had some sense of framing, composition, certainly had uh, a sensibility for what to do with a camera from her photographic ex uh, experience. But this is kind of what she said, and so this is... Bonjour, Agnes! <laughs> Bienvenue en watershed! <laughs> um, this, this is Agnes in her potato suit, and the orange cat you will also be introduced to as we go. Um, so don't fret if you don't know who he is just yet. So she was saying that in the 1950s, to be a director, you first had to be an apprentice, a third assistant, second AD, first AD. You know, it wasn't until you were 40 or 50. This is the kind of traditional route to become a director. 
But she just wrote a script at 25. Uh, she'd never been an AD. She didn't go to film school. She didn't know anything about cinema. And she hadn't, as so far as she says, been to the movies. So she just saw in her mind a movie that she wanted to make. Now, if the internet and the legacy of uh, how we attribute film style is anything to go by, according to our friend the Orange Cat, then other people also thought that that was a pretty good film to make. Ghost in the Shell of 1995. We don't know if Bergman saw it, but potentially Persona in 1966. And there was someone else Someone who definitely had seen Le Pointe Court before they made their film. And that's Alan René with Last Year at Marienbad. And Alan René, that's this figure here, was an extraordinarily good friend of Anya Svada and also one of her colleagues. And one of the figures that make up, along with Anya Svada and uh, Chris Marker, who we'll meet shortly, and a couple of other people, they made up what's known as the Left Bank um, and the Left Bank Group. The one who's probably least well known of that group, I think, is Henri Colpi. I'm not going to speak too much about his work. You can go away and have a look for that if you like. But Alan René worked very closely with Agnès and he actually edited Le Pointe Court. So he certainly was aware of, his, of her filmmaking before he made his films. He's also, uh, for those of you who are familiar with his other work, um, Hiroshima Mon Amour, uh, Night and Fog. So he became quite a famous French filmmaker and a really significant part of that movement. Here he is again. But let's find out who is this orange cat that we have on screen? Because he's going to be taking us through the talk today as well. Well, his name is Guillaume en Egypte. And I think the best way to introduce him is by letting Agnes do it. Let's take a look. Guillaume en Egypte est là. Tranquille, près de nous. Quand il ne se balade pas dans la rue, il rentre chez lui. Il est le porte-parole du cinéaste Chris Marker qui pousse la discrétion jusqu'au secret. Le chat orange représente celui qui veut planquer son visage. Le désordre de son atelier est magnifique. Ce déballage indescriptible, ce sont ses sources d'inspiration, les choses qu'il accumule et ses outils pour fabriquer des films documentaires qui nous écrit de pays lointains ou dans la proximité des grévistes et des manifestants. Il y a des photographies de femmes avec une touche de mystère ou sublimées par un écho. Il a publié des livres. Il a aussi réalisé des films de fiction beaux et inclassables comme la fameuse jetée et Level 5. Voici la face cachée du travail de Marker, les fils secrets du labyrinthe de son œuvre. Merci, Agnès. So that's the introduction to Guillaume en Egypte. He kind of stands in for Chris Marker. This is Chris Marker, a man who didn't like his photograph taken particularly, didn't like to be seen, but we have some photographic evidence of him still. Uh, as Agnes mentioned, he made Le Jeté, very famous film, which speaks also, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it, um, speaks to Vertigo, famous Hitchcock film, which played here recently. Um, so, and speaks to film history and the kind of layers of film history, uh, and also is a very photographic film. So they shared a lot in common, um, Marker, René, and Agnès. And he also made a film called Sans Soleil, which is known as an essay film. And that's quite important because the Left Bank group were known quite a lot for, um, we'll get into the, a little bit the distinction between them and the Nouvelle Vague, so the, the French New Wave, which some of you might have heard about. So the differences between uh, the Left Bank group and the French New Wave had something to do with writing and literature. And so the idea of the essay film is quite important. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit more in just a moment. Um, what I'd like to point to, though, is the way in which these filmmakers collaborated and also the position that Varda had, where she was, she was really key and really early on. So she made her film in 1955, Le Pont Court. Um, and then a lot of these films that are quite famous came later. So she was before films like Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, Abu Souf, you know, before those kind of the 
400 Blows, uh, Le Coup de Sans Coup by France, uh, François Truffaut. So she was really at the center of it. And it's interesting because she's often called the mother or sometimes the grandmother of the French New Wave, right? So she wasn't kind of included in it, but she certainly was circling around it. And a lot of these filmmakers did work together. Um, like I suggested, there was kind of working with each other on each other's films, sometimes credited, sometimes not. But also that there was a project, um, particularly around the time of the Vietnam War, because there's also quite a lot politically in the air when these filmmakers were starting out and when they were accomplished in the 60s and 70s. And there was quite a lot of um, kind of, I guess, a, a sense of political movement being really urgent. And so they filmed um, a documentary uh, far from Vietnam as a kind of collective. And this actually was a collective that spanned the left bank group and the French New Wave. So we'll see that figures like Godard worked with Chris Marker. Um, but there is a pivotal role that Anya Svada paid, played in this as well. So before I explain about her visibility or lack of visibility, um, and maybe we won't know why, I'd like to show a clip from Far From Vietnam. This film's from 1967. Uh, it's a trailer for the film. Depuis 1965, début d'escalade, les Américains ont déversé plus d'un million de tonnes de bombes sur le Vietnam du Nord. C'est-à-dire davantage que sur l'Allemagne pendant toute la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Je sais même pas lire le journal. Dès que ça résonne, dès que ça explique, j'entends plus rien. J'ai pas l'oreille. J'ai pas l'oreille accordée pour ça. Tout ce que j'entends, c'est le cri. Les impérialistes les appellent peut-être des ralliés, mais ils sont pour nous et continuent à faire office d'agents de renseignement. Leur cœur n'est pas de l'autre côté. Et les peuples, donc, ont deux alternatives. Ou doubler, ou lutter. Mais ils vont à un autre pays et ils vont se battre. Pour quoi L'Amérique est violente, très violente. situation révolutionnaire en France, nous devons crier au contraire plus fort.
So who are these other friends, assistants and uh, technicians that worked on the film? And you could certainly be forgiven for being a bit confused if you went to the internet and if you looked on, you know, the very basic first search, go to the Wikipedia entry and it'll tell you that six revolutionary filmmakers from France's New Wave era come together in this documentary to demonstrate their collective contempt for the Vietnam War. And then the list has seven names, one of which is Anya Sparta which is curious. Um, what happened was that her contribution to this film was not included, but she was still officially credited on the project. Now, the reason for which why, I don't know why her film was not, her section of the filming was not included in the final product, but the fact that she's still officially credited on the film, even though it is quite clearly and demonstrably in that trailer by six filmmakers, um, speaks to how central she was to the work that was going on, even if she wasn't always the most visible or the most lauded. So with the Nouvelle Vague um, and the 400 Blows and Breathless, all these films that came after Agnes Svarda's La Pointe Court, she'd already kind of started and made her mark and in quite a radical way. If you've seen the film, it's formally uh, really surprising and very innovative. Um, the first film credited as being part of the Nouvelle Vague, Le Beau Serge by Claude Chabrol, also a figure who's probably not quite as well celebrated as Truffaut or Godard, surprising as he was considered to be the French Hitchcock. Um, so he certainly is probably the more appealing in terms of genre cinema and the more accessible, um, and yet not the most famous. So thinking about Agnès Varda's original statement that she wanted to be radical and she wanted to find shapes. What was it that she brought to this movement that was so taken up by the Nouvelle Vague, even if she wasn't officially seen to be a part of it? And we'll go on to have a, a little bit more of a questioning as to why that might be. Um, and I think to that effect, how many people here have seen La Pointe Court, which showed here last week? Okay, a few of you have. If you haven't seen it yet, um, we'll just give you a taster today. It's a really extraordinary film um, and visually very beautiful. So let's take a quick look at uh, a minute or so of this film. Tu vois, c'est ici la pointe courte. Tu m'en as parlé si souvent. cette maison, j'y suis né. Celle-là Oui. Et voilà le chantier. Il y a longtemps que j'avais envie de revenir. Sans moi, pourquoi n'es-tu pas revenu plus tôt Sans toi ou avec toi Aucune différence pour toi. Je ne dis pas cela. Mais ce que j'ai retrouvé ici est à moi tout seul. Okay. So, in this clip, we see a number of things that are quite unusual. Um, we don't seem to be focusing only on the protagonists. They're there, they're talking, the dialogue is running along, and yet all Agnes is focused on are those trees and the stumps and the shapes that they make. And she wanted to find shapes, as she said, but she also wanted to show something of the place. At the start of the film, it's a dedication that comes up, or a tributement, uh, that says that the film is made by Agnes Varda and the inhabitants of La Pointe Court. So this film is made supposedly with the people from the village. It is fictionalized, and this is where we'll start to get into the playfulness of fiction and reality that Varda explores, in that there are fictional storylines about a child dying, there are fictional storylines about contamination and the food and the produce, but there are very real things in this film as well, and in some senses, it could be considered documentary or neorealism. Now, there's a really great resistance 
especially from critics, to call Agnes Varda's work neorealist. Um, potentially that could be partially because she refuted herself having had the kind of academic history of film history. So she would say that she hadn't seen those films by Italian neorealist filmmakers, so how could she be emulating it or inspired by it? And yet it's so present in the work. Um, and there is certainly a desire to show the everyday, to show what happened in that village, to show the practices of fishing, what that meant to the community, and to show those people. Um, and I think that this is a really interesting tension because these characters who she has in the film, and this is again the very kind of literary way in which Agnes Varda films uh, her stories, is that, that it's very Brechtian. So, and that comes up time and again. These two characters are very alienating, the way they speak, what they're saying. I mean, they're from Paris for a start. What are they doing in this village? Um, you know, why are they there? They're outsiders, they're intruding, and their kind of relationship doesn't seem to make too much sense. And Varda said, what I hope to show in La Pointe Court was the paralysis of the couple who can't seem to shake free of their intellectual and emotional problems, and hence can't manage to think about their affinity to any group. I wanted my audience to understand that there's no connection between social issues and private problems. I presented a couple in crisis, and not only between themselves, but in terms of their ability to connect with others. And that's a really fascinating and also, I think, problematic, um, problematic statement because she, we will return to the idea of social issues and private problems. And sometimes in her films, I think those things are distinct, and at other times, they're really deeply interwoven. Certainly later when we come to L'autre uh, part, one sings, the other doesn't, in that the personal and the political uh, are very much entwined there where she starts to address gender politics. But there was someone who understood the neorealist capabilities or qualities of Agnes Varda's work, and that was André Bazin. Uh, and he was a contemporary of hers. Uh, if you've heard about Cahiers du Cinéma, the kind of premier film criticism, film journal that uh, was created around about the same time. And this is also some way to starting to understand the differences between the left group uh, the left bank group and the Nouvelle Vague in that many of those filmmakers from the Nouvelle Vague, so Francois Truffaut, Jacques Rivette, Eric Roma, uh, Jean-Luc Godard, is that they were also writing um, critically and theoretically about film for Le Cahier du Cinema. And the supposed group of the left bank, so Chris Marker, Alan René, Alan Espada, were not writing about the films. They were making work and making it only. Um, but Bazin really interpreted the neorealism as working within a humanist framework. And he, he kind of understood it for its ability to establish social relations and conflict, which we see in the way that the fishermen and their boats are constantly in the, in the background, having a different conflict to the one that our characters are having. So the couple are kind of having a sort of literary or theatrical sort of dialogue. It's very deliberately artificial. Um, the structure, she says, was inspired by William Faulkner's The Wild Palms. So again, her film's actually inspired by literature, and that's the case for quite a, few, quite a number of her works. Um, a friend who is actually present today did say that this film felt kind of like it had Bergman characters before they, Bergman was even doing it. So, you know, there was this sense of it being sort of uh, almost like futuristically inventive. Um, but there's something to be questioned still about the power dynamics, and Varda's really aware of this, and she suggests that we question it in the way in which she made the film. So with, with the neorealism that supposedly is or is not there, do we, do we see or hear those characters? How well do we hear or see them? Where does the camera look, and what does it go to? We saw it just ignore its protagonists and go straight past them to find a shape. How does it frame the fishermen and the villagers in the film? Do we look at them or do we look past them? She also, due to having pretty much no money to make this film, it was made on about 14,000 francs or something like that, and, you know, a uh, very kind of simplistic first film. She didn't have the money to make sound, to record sound. So that was all done in post-production. What she did, because she did her script in an interesting way as well, is that she wrote down everything people said on set so that she could have that as accurately dubbed as possible. Obviously, the two main actors were able to come to Paris and do the post-sync recording, but the villagers were not. And so she had people either with similar accents or impersonating their accents record that sound. And then she showed it to them and they were all really angry because they didn't think that was how that they, they sounded and they were really unhappy about it. Um, and, you know, she's aware of that and acknowledges it. 
But what also happened with this film is, and again, thanks to Bazan, is that Agnes Varda didn't know what to do with it. She didn't know how to create the buzz and get the film out there. Um, and Andre Bazan really was, you know, very activist about what he was doing. So he arranged a special screening for her at the Cannes Film Festival in 1955. Um, and advertised it in Le Film Francais, invited the influential and important kind of professionals in the field, and praised it in his own writing as the revelation of the festival. So he really was kind of the first advocate um, for the work of Agnes Varda. No distributor would distribute the film because it was made completely independently, which meant that it w did not have the authorization of the Centre National de la Cinéma Grata Cinématographique. Uh, so it was only screened in cinema clubs. Bazan says of this film, a total freedom of style which creates the impression so rare in cinema that we are in the presence of a work that obeys only the dreams and desires of its auteur with no other external obligations. What a freedom uh, that must be to, to have your work praised as being so free from the systems that it is so singularly auteurist. This is her first film. She has made nothing else at this point. Um, that she said of it, there are no dramatic events, just the juxtaposition of two worlds and two ways of seeing the world. One is carefully crafted in terms of framing and dialogue, the other is more like Italian neorealism. That was retrospectively. So she does acknowledge that there is some link. So thinking about the auteurist theory then, which was pretty much something invented by La Caille de Cinema, so those people from the Nouvelle Vague writing at the time, and they decided that it was kind of like, or they theorized it as if the camera still owes, so as if the, the, a cinematic pen um, that was kind of authoring the work. And Agnes Varda has her own term. She talks about her work as cinecriture, which is a type of cine writing. Um, and the distinction between the two is probably as close or vague as the distance between the left bank and the Nouvelle Vague. There's certainly a lot of crossover. But what she talks about with Cinecriture is uh, writing the film on the screen as if that were the writing. And when we talked about her being kind of literary or thinking about things from a, a literary perspective, what that also means is that she, she was fed up with the typical way that the system works. She wrote scripts and nobody wanted to fund them and it didn't work out uh, through the kind of traditional channels. So she said, you know what, I'm not writing scripts anymore. Um, I write all my ideas down a couple of pages and nobody can make this but me. It can only be me who makes this film. Um, I'll make it or I won't do it. And so she would kind of write her film with lighting, with the lens, with the actual tools of filmmaking. And that's how she kind of understands her own films. Other shapes in Agnes Varda, the gleaners and I. Uh, and it's worth saying that Agnes has this beautiful quote uh, that she says, I am a heart-shaped potato, and I am ready to grow again. <laughs> Merci, Agnes. <laughs> so, with the gleaners and I, this is the heart, one of many heart-shaped potatoes that she finds. She is referencing some of her art history, um, and she, sh she'll tell you more about this. The film is showing <laughs> next week, so you can see the gleaners and I. I won't go into it too deeply, but she tells you with the gleaners um, that a lot of it came from the inspiration from this painting by Jean-Francois Millet uh, in 1857. And this was not so long after the French Revolution, so there was actually a sense of the kind of, at a Paris salon, of the bourgeois or the aristocracy being quite shocked and threatened by this image. Um, now, all it is is some, some peasant women picking up after the harvest, gleaning what's left on the land. But this kind of idea of an almost threat from uh, the underclass was prevalent in society. And it's something that she's kind of commenting on and constantly returning to. Uh, she, after The Gleaners and I, she returned two years later to make The Gleaners and I two years later. Um, she presented it at the Viennale. That's when she dressed in 2011 in a potato suit. Um, and, you know, uh, we will also see a little bit more of that kind of physical playfulness uh, with her the release of her new film, which comes out in September, called Visage, Village, Faces, Places. Um, and I very much urge you all to see that as well because it's um, testament to the fact that she is still making work and still pursuing these ideals of social justice and looking at the landscape um, in France, looking at the landscape in a more wider context, looking at what what people are doing and what effect the sort of wastefulness or excess of our contemporary world has on them. 
So, here she is again talking to that orange cat. Um, she was a photographer and she maintains she has always stayed one and that it is a way of seeing. Um, so she was formally educated in art history, as I said. She studied at the Ecole de Louvre before she worked as a professional photographer for the Théâtre National Populaire, famous French theatre company. She constantly moves between fiction and reality. And this is something that you really, you saw in Le Point Court, but you'll see it as well with the kind of playfulness with which she approaches social realist themes and the literary ways in which she constructs it through the narrative. So, my favorite probably of all of her films, which is a ridiculous thing to say because they're all brilliant, but my favorite sh maybe short of her film, um, as our little cat suggests, is that the images, they have a rhythm, they move, they flow, they kind of ebb and flow between reality and fiction. Um, and the, one of the best examples of this is a short film called Uncle Yanko, and we'll just watch a few, just the very start of it. You'll have to seek it out from the video shop afterwards. Varda? Really? Uh, I'm bringing someone who would like to meet you, uh, Agnes Varda. Agnes? Yes. Agnes. Is she the daughter of Eugène? Since they bob. Vous êtes la fille d'Eugène Varda? Oui, oui, c'est moi. You are the daughter of Eugène Varda? Yes, I am. Is he Cory to Evienu Varda? Yes. Oui. Since he take two. Uh, is he Cory to, to Varda? To Evienu? Oui. Down. Vous êtes la fille. Seen. Vous êtes. C.A. Hey. The daughter of a jeune Varda. Coop. Seen C12. La même chose. Je voudrais que ce soit un peu plus gâté. Alors tu es, ma nièce. Oh oui, on dirait. Mais oui. So, looking into her own name, Varda, finding another Varda, <laughs> a man on a boat somewhere in Greece, um, finding this person, connecting with him. Her film shows us the greeting and the moment in which they connect over and over again, the, re the repetition, the reframing of it. Um, and she does that a number of times to reveal the artifice, to kind of bring us closer to the actual reality of the fiction she's creating. So on the one hand, it's extraordinarily playful because she's going through this, this delightful, warm moment of meeting someone over and over again. But it's also very serious because it is um, a unique moment for her to meet this man and it was special. And I guess in a way, the only way to capture that is to capture and recapture and recapture because the essence of what that moment was really like can't really be displayed by one take potentially of filming. Uh, she also made, and these films are not screening in the Gleaning Tooth season, but films like Documenteur, where she actually has such a, a real part of her own life on screen that that's her son who is in her, who is in her movie. And a couple of slides ago, uh, we saw the little girl there is Rosalie Varda. That's her daughter on the set of uh, La Demoiselle de Rochefort with Catherine Deneuve, uh, and we'll get to whose film that is in just a moment. Um, and then we come to this, which is the one that I alluded to before. I haven't seen it. It's playing from Monday. We can all discover it together this week. But who are these people? And which one of them is real? And this is something that Agnes Varda had to play with, because by the time she got to making Jacques Audenon, Jacques Demy, who was uh, the other member of the left bank that we haven't mentioned so far, who made beautiful films, uh, musicals, the young women of Rochefort, La Demoiselle de Rochefort, and Le Parapluie de Cherbourg, the um, Umbrellas of Cherbourg. And he was at a point in his life, he made really beautiful films. He was part of this movement, a really key part of it. He also raised her children with, uh, raised the children with Agnes Varda, one of which was not his but he was very ill towards the end of his life. Um, and he had been writing, and again we come to this kind of writing, he'd been writing notebooks and reflections about his life, but he didn't have uh, the ability to make a film. He told her he was too ill and too tired, you do it. Um, so she wrote his memories on screen, 
And she invented, as she says, some of the history based from the writing that she had, from the books, from his retelling. So it's a really authentic film. She also used some of his cinema uh, to fill in the gaps to understand how to make the film. So it's authentic, but it's also a complete fiction. Uh, and it's a fiction about, with fondness, about someone who, who was very dear to her and whom she loved. Another documentary that she made, which kind of creates this idea of real fictions, um, is to do with her locale and where she where she lived and the shops and the people around her. So she is on Rue Daguerre, uh, and she says that the people around her were Daguerres. So she thought that she would make a, fel a film about them, not the photographs. So we're going to watch a very short clip from the start of a film called Daguerreotypes. Mesdames et Messieurs, j'ai l'honneur de vous présenter un film dont le titre est Daguerreotype. Comme vous le savez, Mesdames et Messieurs, on appelle Daguerreotype les premiers portraits photographiques réalisés par Daguerre dès 1839. Ce film, par contre, tourné en 1975, rue Daguerre, à Paris, a été réalisé par Agnès Varda et quelques techniciens du cinéma, dont Nourrit à vivre, William Lubchansky, Roland Vincent, Michel Terrier et Christian Bachmann pour l'image. Antoine Bonfanti et Jeff Auger pour le son, Gordon Soir et André Chotti pour le montage, Joël David pour la lumière, Christophe Saint-Dreux pour le reste. Laboratoire éclair, auditorium SIS, visa de contrôle numéro 44089. Produit par Ciné Tamaris, voici donc un film d'Agnès Varda, Daguerreotype. For a film that's introducing a documentary about people in shops, the people of the street, this has a really quite strange beginning. Um, and this is a real ode to the beginnings of cinema, to the magic of the movies. And this is the playfulness with which Agnes Varda approaches her really quite serious subjects. I mean, this is a documentary that goes on to very much just be observatory about the people in the shops that work and live around her. Um, but she has this magician, this character who introduces it, this grandeur. She talks about um, and provokes the kind of historical context in which we source images um, and how these films and how these images would have been presented early on pre-cinema. She even, in the way that she kind of takes this, this shot is really slow, actually. We've frozen on this frame, but these shots are slow. Um, and that's also a kind of ode to the very slow exposures with which uh, the photography at the time would have taken place. So to make a daguerreotype, which was on a sort of mirrored uh, surface as well. So we had this kind of res this idea of reflections, which comes up a lot, and you'll see it in The Beaches of Agnes, that she's very interested in mirrors and mirror reflections. She's thinking about mirroring society from 1890 whatever. She's thinking about mirroring the daguerreotypes that were made at the time. She's thinking about mirroring the society around her and looking at reflections of herself in the society in which she lives. Those are all really deep and serious issues, but she's approaching them with such playfulness and such joy um, because she wants you to understand that even this presentation of something serious is still warm and loving and that love and that warmth I think always comes through in her work. She's also, maybe at this point in her career, I, I'd like to think she'd probably read some of Bazin's work. She's maybe also referring to his kind of theories um, about the ontology of the photographic image, the way in which it's captured, um, and how it kind of is something that is, is not just represented, but almost living or encapsulated within those frames. Why does she spend so much time reading? <laughs> Why do we have those titles read out while we're just looking at film cans? Because we're looking at the physical objects of this history. We're looking at the physicality of the way in which we preserve and understand the medium. Uh, so this is a not very good uh, picture, but it is um, an image of from 1899 on 
the left side, uh, and from 1975 in her film Daguerreotypes. These are both images of uh, knife sharpeners. And you can see that there is a really clear kind of allusion to the way in which early photography was in the kind of pictures that she constructs in her film. Now, I said before that we talked about my favorite Anya Svada film with Uncle Yanko, but obviously you can't have a favorite. So this is my other favorite Anya Svada film, Le Bonheur, um, which is probably one of the most beautiful and devastating films you will ever see. Uh, I hope that some of you did have the chance to see it here on the big screen last week. This is the film um, that really takes us back to inventing cinema, being happy to be a woman, wanting to be radical, and wanting to find shapes. She does all of those things so extraordinarily well in this film. It's also her connection to art history. So we really have that very obvious connection to Van Gogh's sunflowers and wheat fields, but it's infused with a kind of happiness, but also a really insipid yellowy green. That is the melancholia of the film. And I mean melancholia in a really um, Freudian sense, and I think it applies to Van Gogh as well as to her film Le Bonheur. And that's the idea of like Freud's melancholia was really about grieving a loved one as if they had died, even though they go on living because they don't want you anymore, right? Like there's something inherently um, melancholic about that particular type of grief. It's the grief for something that's not there or something that is there but is absent. And so I think we really get these kind of psychological worlds coming out through her film, these references to literature, these references to art. They're very deep. But this film was dismissed um, quite significantly by critics, potentially not just at the time, but since then a lot of people thought she was just, you know, doing the kind of... Um, very obvious thing which she is also doing and that's alluding to images from fashion magazines like Elle and Marie Claire uh, which would have had very similar beautiful kind of technicolor looking like advertisements um, in the way in which the picnics in the sun take place but she wasn't just photographing them for for the pleasure of looking at those images or those colors or those beautiful dresses and every dress in this film is honestly stunning but it's not for that reason there's so much critical distance um, and retrospectively she said this it's quite lengthy quote so forgive me while I read but she said this about the film when you look more closely actually no we'll to say this first she started out with minimal impressions and feelings family photos so this is her kind of inspiration for Le Bonheur thinking about the way in which people in those picnics and in those kind of magazine photos or actual photos look like they're all happy um, and we wonder a little bit about what that happiness might be. And she says, when you look more closely, you get an uneasy feeling. All these people, it's simply not possible. There are 15 people in the picture, old people, women, children. It's not possible they could have all been happy at the same moment. Or else you wonder, what is happiness since they all look so happy? The appearance of happiness is also a form of happiness. And these impressions which are connected to the related pleasure of making a home movie, you know, a blurred up close up of a kid's face who's just entered the frame, are the source of my film. Happiness is also a play of mirrors. Come to mirrors again. I'm happy. I say I'm happy. I want the other person to be happy because I say that I am happy. Because even if it's a notion that one can have all by oneself, it's always much stronger if it's shared. Like at picnics, this kind of collective joy when all the families get along well, when all their kids frolicking on the grass and the others are lying down under the trees getting ready to take a nap. It's all related pretty closely to a feeling for nature. The film is first and foremost a mix of emotions in which the plot is secondary. And I think that's really key, trying to think about understanding her works as narrative emotion rather than driven by plot and potentially that's one of the reasons they were also somewhat dismissed. So after reflecting on Le Bonheur, thinking about the fact that she still had these film prints of all of her films lying around, uh, and having, re having made The Gleaners and I in 2000, she started to think a lot more seriously about recycling, but also what that meant within the film industry and what she should do with these film prints that she had. Um, what happens to the theatrical life of a physical film print when, aside from a few retrospectives here and there, nobody wants to show it anymore. Well, she created an installation. 
And this installation is a house. It's a kind of greenhouse. It houses sunflowers, so it actually has them inside. It's made from some 2,500 meters of the 35 mil print that was Le Bonheur. And those imagined family photographs that she so beautifully had moving in front of us on screen are now still again. And they are still images through which you can glean a look at a sunflower growing in the midst. These are the images of the so-called happiness slowed down frame by frame. It's a recycled happiness, potentially. So Ivada recycles images from the women's magazines uh, in the close-ups. She also, in the film, has uh, a lot of close-ups on hands, women's hands doing domestic tasks. And a lot of the, what those uh, magazines would have had would be the same images of women's hands. So we don't see the face or the body, just the hand ironing, perhaps preparing a meal, tending to the children. And here we start to get into her politics around the domestic space uh, and gender depression and what she kind of thought about that. Um, and she said this as part of the next film that we'll look at. In the family, the man is the bourgeois and the woman is the proletariat. So that's a movie that she made, and we'll come to it in a moment. But she also signed a manifesto, Manifesto 343. And this was also known as the Manifesto of the 343 Sluts. It was advocating for the reproductive rights and legalized abortions for women in France at the time. Uh, she signed alongside some extraordinarily famous women of the era, Simone de Beauvoir, Jean Moreau, Marguerite de Ras, Catherine Deneuve, François Sagan, Delphine Seyrig, Anne Wazemski, and Sonia Raquel. So they were all advocating for this change. Um, and she wanted to make a movie out of it, and she tried. And the first movie that she had, uh, the screenplay, I, I think, before she stopped writing them, um, was called My, the, My Body Is Mine. And that was a really political film. She couldn't get a producer to take it on. She couldn't get funding for it. The only way she could do this was to go back and, and kind of reflect on it later. So by the time we get to L'Enchant L'Autre Pas, One Sings, The Other Doesn't, it's actually 1977. So it's quite significantly later than when abortions are now legal in France. But she was physically on those picket lines. Um, and so we'll take a quick look at one of the clips before we talk about One Sings, The Other Doesn't. Dix ans plus tard, Suzanne et Pauline suivaient de très près le procès d'une jeune fille de 16 ans qui avait avorté. Beaucoup de celles et de ceux qui luttaient contre la loi punissant l'avortement étaient venus devant le palais de justice de Bobigny où se déroulait à huis clos le procès. C'était en octobre 1972. La jeune fille d'ailleurs fut acquittée. Ce fut le début d'une série de réformes. So she was really inspired as well to make this film after visiting the US. 
She visited America. She shot a documentary short film about the Black Panthers and she was extraordinarily inspired by their absolute determination to be themselves. And this was what also put, I think, the fire underbelly to return to this idea and to make this film. Uh, it's an anti-Hollywood musical. So there's no choreography for a start. Um, it's about two women's relationship with each other, not about a relationship between a man and a woman, though they do have relationships in the film. It is fundamentally about those two women and their friendship. Um, and it comes after contemporaries of hers, including her husband, have made films, have made musicals that were more kind of Hollywood-esque, even though they were poking fun at it. So Jacques Demy's uh, Le, Le Demoiselle de Rochefort had Gene Kelly in it in 1967. After that, there was Une Femme Une Femme, uh, sorry, before that in 1961 by Jean-Luc Godard. These were musicals poking fun at American musicals, but still in the style of those American musicals and made by her male contemporaries. So this is the first time she's like, I'm making a musical. It is going to have no big numbers and no choreography. It is just people singing about abortion rights. You know, this is really quite an unusual um, musical. And and the words in her songs are, you know, particularly, uh, you know, really intense and damning um so sh she's actually going straight to political argument and she talks a lot about um the the kind of uh i guess she's she's looking at Engels and marx and she's looking at these ideas and these these sorts of exploitation and labor ideas um, to do with domesticity and thinking about the way in which women do twice as much work by working out in their jobs and then working again in the domestic space um, and this this is where we get a little bit angry. The next one's going to be angry. But before we get there, um, I just want to point out one of the things to do with the protagonist, Pom, in One Sings the Other Doesn't, is that there's a scene where she goes to Amsterdam, um, and this is something that women were actually doing in France. They were going abroad to get their abortions, and they were doing that under the auspices of the movement for the legislation of abortion and contraception, and that meant that women could travel. And Agnes Varda was a key part of that movement. She was an advocate for it. And so even though the film is a fiction, it actually draws very heavily on real-life experiences, not just of other women, but also her own. Um, so the angry film, where we get to is... Again, my favourite Agnes Varda film. They're all favourites. Um, Vagabond. This is the first Agnes Varda film I ever saw, and what a film to begin with. Um, this, this is really the most full-bellied, fiery Agnes Varda film that there is. This is the one where, in interviews, she said, um, and the film kind of has this scene about... Uh, this is our protagonist, Mona, about somebody talking about her, her nice as a piece of nice ass. And she says, when all you can say about a woman is nice ass, you annihilate her. That is all about the way in which you just completely kill women. And this film starts with her protagonist dying. And she is dead at the start of the film. So there is no tension. And Agnes Varda refused to create narrative tension with, will she die? Can the audience invest their empathy in wanting her to live? No, we know she's dead straight from the start. It's not a spoiler. That's how the film begins. She is dead. You cannot save this woman because society has already killed her. But what we will see is how society has killed her afterwards, right? So it's a really passionate and um, extremely um, enraged film, and it comes from the belly. Uh, the title in French is Sans Toi Ni Loi, which is sort of like without roof or without shelter and without law. It also sounds very close to Ni Foi Ni Loi, neither faith nor law. And it also evokes this idea of the roi, the, the king, the lion, the law, the patriarchy. So within this very small title, she's kind of talking about all of those things. She's pointing to every single one of those things. Um, and we also see in this image the, the landscape behind Mona, which is so much like the Gleaners and I. Um, this landscape, this peasantry, this woman, this ugly woman that back in the Paris Salon they wouldn't have wanted to see after the French Revo Revolution. And we still don't want to see her in society now. Nobody wants to see her. Um, and, you know, she's, uh, we might all feel sorry for her, but she's not the most likable character. She's also a tough, tough person in this film. 
Um, she was a 15-year-old actress when Agnes Varda met her, so she's, ex she's extremely young. Um, and the question the film poses is, how much do you pay to be free? This character is a psychological study. It's all about, not necessarily, it's dying from the elements, but it's also dying from loneliness, from a lack of social cohesion. Um, incidentally, when she showed this film in Russia, she did say that the audience had just one question afterwards, which was, how is it possible, filmed in the south of France, that this woman could have died from the elements in only minus two? It has to be at least minus 25 for anybody to die. So aside from the Russians not believing that the, anybody could die under these conditions, um, the film is realistic and it chases that idea of neorealism. It's also a movement film, right? So there's like all of the shots are of Mona walking. She's walking and the camera is moving. It's all of these kind of following shots. Um, it's quite a silent film, it uses music sparingly, but when it does, to great effect. And she uses those sorts of like nostalgia to get at the serious issues. And we'll see that again in The Beaches of, of Agnes. She'll talk, she'll talk more about this film, so I don't want to do it all for her. Uh, so, how much to pay, who pays, she wanted to, Agnes Varda just wanted to, to see her character walk and to film that. But there are always prices with film and film industry and film history. Um, and it's taken an awful long time for this wonderful filmmaker who made Cleo Sankaset, her most famous film, which I've not talked about um, but, and probably don't have time to say too much about now. Um, it took a long time for her to get recognition. Now, she did win uh, a Venice Lion along the way, a Silver Bear at the Berlinale, but she wasn't really uh, kind of noticed by the establishment in some ways till the end of her career. Well, I say the end, she's still making films now, but towards this latter part of her career. She turned 90 this year, so she's, you know, she's been doing it for a very long time. Um, so her new film is with this guy in the hat called JR, and we'll just watch a short clip of him uh, after she was nominated for an Oscar. Hey, Agnes, I think there's some people who want to say hello to you. Agnes. Hi. Hi. Yes. And congratulations. You're asking. Have fun. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks for visiting. <laughs> You're everywhere, Agnes. How do you do that? So that's from an iPhone. Uh, it's posted on JR's Twitter feed. So this is just a little video for social media. You'll notice that he's hanging out with some pretty famous people who've won quite a few awards in their um, time as filmmakers and actors um, over the, the series of their career. And, and Agnes is there as a cardboard cutout. I don't really need to explain the significance of that. I think it speaks for itself, but it's interesting that this is the way in which she is present among still some of those more celebrated circles. So, she said this recently, um, actually at the BFI, uh, just after one of her um, film screenings. She said, we live in a zapping system. We jump from one feeling to another. We're getting a lot of images all day long. And, and, and you know, the, her whole life is images. She's constructed everything in images. But, and as Guillaume en Egypte will tell us, she has been memed. So, on the right-hand side, we have a meme, uh, Jean-Luc Godard me, whoever that is in this particular instance, and Agnes Varda holding back. And it's curious because Jean-Luc Godard is this huge towering figure of her career, right? He's, you know, this incredibly famous, one of the most famous French filmmakers. You know, he's always credited as being the front runner of the Nouvelle Vague, even though we know he wasn't. He was there. He was an important aspect of it. He wasn't the first. Um, he is an incredible filmmaker, I'd like to say. I think his films are extraordinary, but he is always the one that is getting the credit. And yet, Agnes Varda is his friend, right? So, and they've been friends a long time. And when you see Faces, Places in September, you'll see how kindly he treats his friend Agnes Varda in her older age, not so kindly. And yet she still defends him. Um, and to the left, what we have is the one bit that I am showing you from Cleo Sankaset, which is the short film within the film. Um, and this is a short silent film that our character, uh, played by Corinne Marchand, Cleo goes to watch. And in this film, it's Jean-Luc Godard uh, and um, uh, Anna Karina playing the characters of this silent era. And the whole joke of the film is about the kind of dark 
tinted lens that he wears. And if you know anything about Jean-Luc Godard, you know he never takes his glasses off, ever, not in interviews, not nothing, ever, never takes them off. The only time there is even a photograph of him without his glasses on is for this silent film within Agnes Varda's film. Now, whether or not that's because it was still early days in his career or potentially he didn't think that actually, you know, the film would be so successful, we'll, we'll never know. But uh, this is the only footage of him without his glasses on. And it's really this whole idea of this film within a film for Agnes Varda is about revealing the lens through which we watch things. And it's a playful sketch. It's comedy. It's silly. It's Buster Keaton-esque. It's, you know, kind of absurd. But it's really seriously talking about film history. It's alluding again to early and silent cinema, um, the modes of those productions, and how we understand those stories in a contemporary time. So... In 2015, the Cannes Film Festival finally gave Agnes Varda an award. Hooray! Um, maybe they just needed to see her in a potato suit first. <laughs> I look forward to my award later next year. Um, they gave her the Palme d'Honneur. So this is the Lifetime Achievement Award. And it recognizes a filmmaker who's not been previously won the Palme d'Or. So for any filmmaker that hasn't won that award, and yet their, film, their films and their career and their life has made a global impact. And she is the first French and the first female director to receive this award. It's only gone to a few other people. Really, this is an award that basically says, oops, sorry, we didn't award any of your films, even though you're one of the foremost contemporary filmmakers and you've you know, been such a key part of a movement. Um, and, and this is the kind of retrospective way in which she's starting to be acknowledged. Uh, we, we see it too with the Oscars. I mean, you know, with Faces Places is a great documentary, but to think that none of her other films had ever been nominated, that she hadn't had that prestige for some of the works that had come before, is really quite something. Um, so we'll let Agnes Varda talk a little bit about what this legacy means to her now. It's a very short clip. Look at that box. It's full of DVDs of all my films and other things. 60 years of creation, not even four pounds. <laughs> it's like nothing, it's like nothing. This is, you can have it. So everything in one tidy little box, to Vada, <laughs> all in one box. That's her TED talk, by the way, you can watch it all online if you want to hear the rest of the joyous things she said. She is a delightful person. Um, but produce, photographing reality always includes something else. So she knows that, she says that. Um, and she says basically that she's learned a lot about what an image means. This is what her whole life has been working towards, is what do images mean? What are they for? What do they tell us? What do they tell us about ourselves? How can we enjoy them and enjoy each other's humanity, but also what can we learn and how can we change society? And those are things that I think she is really trying to do through her films. Um, and she says that it taught her and it was, for her, a way of showing the diversity of life, the work and the difficulty. We always have a contradiction of private life, private feelings, and what we know about the world. Photography asked me to see images and try to understand what it means. And I think here we come back to that idea at the beginning about whether or not social issues and private life actually are intertwined. And I think she goes back on herself a little bit in her career of thinking about whether or not they are. Um, and that actually all of the stories are political. I think we see in the 70s um, with her kind of gendered critiques that she does start to think that those things are all deeply political. She, oh, she started off from aesthetics, from art history, from photography, from the composition and the framing of the works, but she was always looking past those constructed protagonists. She always went past them. She wasn't really interested in their story, even though she put them there. She wanted to look for something else, and she was looking further and deeper into the image. And I think what her films teach us is how to look further, how to look again. And actually, like many great works of art, they are so much more rewarding on repeat viewings to watch them again and again. It's more as teased out every time you watch her work. 
I think I've definitely over-talked my uh, stay, so I apologise for that. I think we've probably got a tiny bit more time in this room if anybody does have a question or anything you'd like to say. Um, but I would also like to, as Tara Pomme de Terre Juda, uh, give my remerciement to the following people. I could not have stood here today in this potato without Becca and Daisy and the crew at 20th Century Flicks. Um, I would like to thank Peter Walsh for putting the clips together and everyone at Watershed for allowing me to do this talk in a potato suit thank you very much um, to Mark Cosgrove and Madeline Props who have been very supportive and also to Curse on Artificial Eye for um, allowing me to be filmed wearing this extraordinary potato suit. Merci.